Um, okay, so the 1980s. What do we know about the 1980s? I'll start with a brief introduction, and then we will steam into where it matters to us, which is uh, the impact of the 1980s, changes in the 1980s on, on business. So some images from the 1980s. What, what do we, why, why do we bring this decade in to a course on Britain and the international economy post-1945? Yeah. Very good. It was it was a big shift between the demand side, Keynesianism, and supply side economics, and so it was an end to what we refer to in the previous lecture, very good, uh, as Putskerism, and that might have relevance to British business. It's the it's the period sort of so simultaneous. This poster here from. Possibly from 1979, when President uh, when Reagan was president-elect, Margaret Thatcher in May 1979 was elected as the first woman prime minister. I'm old enough to have associated her with her previous ministerial role, which was as education secretary for Ted Heath between 1970 and 1974, where she most famously, for me at least, abolished free school milk. But also, uh, another one of her achievements was to abolish more grammar schools than any other education secretary. Something that, something that I don't know if she'd have been hugely proud of. And yet, from this, from these beginnings, we have, you know, quite a monumental, love her or loathe her, figure in British politics more so than possibly any prime minister that we have had in the post-war period in terms of the ability to dominate cabinet and dominate an agenda. Reaganomics. Uh, this, is, this is Reagan selling his 1981 budget on primetime TV. What was that all about? Okay, so not a very sophisticated graph. Uh, so, Reaganomics and supply-side economics. So, re reduced government uh, spending, reduced income and capital gains marginal tax rates. This isn't just a British story, these kind of 83% marginal tax rates, though very often in the literature we kind of think it is. America and parts of America have very high marginal tax rates. Reduce government re regulation and control the money supply to reduce inflation. So there'll be a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of talk about that, but not in this lecture, because we're going to be concentrating on the effects on the British business, but just as an introduction. And a big part of the supply side economics, this is Arthur Laffer, and this is Arthur Laffer's curve. Who's, who's come across this? The Laffer curve. Almost everyone. Okay, so it's the idea that there is this kind of optimal level of, of taxation which maximises gov government revenue of taxable income. And tax above that income, and, and that income will kind of avoid taxation. And uh, this was very instrumental to, uh, and uh, very influential to uh, the Reagan administration. And part of this was if you reduce taxation, increase incentives, and you also potentially, contra in, a, in a kind of contradictory way, possibly increase government revenue. This, this struck, struck me as funny, okay? Uh, this, this picture of them all laughing, and, and then I told them not to worry, the wealth would trickle down. So there was this idea that if the rich got richer, the <coughs> poor would benefit too. So if you, you, if you increased incentives through wealth generation, the ability to generate wealth, then the economy would benefit and everyone would benefit. Okay, so but when you look at the data, so I've, I had one bit of data which was kind of short run immediate analysis, which was in the... Uh, the previous lecture slides, but it's quite old, from 1988, so just after Bush, Bush Senior took over from Reagan. And this is totally looking at a longer run. Okay, so percentage change in aggregate family income, okay? And this is based on tax data, so it's taxable income. More on that later. And these are 10 percentile, if you like, of, of all income earners. So the top 10%, Benefit, nearly 20% rise in income, or rise in percentage share of income of um, over this period, 1970, so from the end of the Carter administration through Reagan to Bush Senior, and the the vast majority do not, all the way up to 60% of 
households of family income um, are seeing negative, and at the 70, it's zero. Zero um, growth in, in at constant prices, so discounted for inflation. So we're not seeing a lot of the trickle down. So, the, so reducing marginal tax rates did mean that the tax, uh, the rich got richer, but the poor didn't, the poor and medium income owners, we're hearing a lot about uh, a squeeze on middle incomes in Britain now. Um, and this, the data in America, the squeeze on middle incomes begins with Reagan, or the end of the Carter administration. What did the Laffer curve do in terms of tax revenues though? Did they increase? Did, well, did one of the objectives here to reduce government spending, did, you know, was that reduce government spending, raise government revenue? What happened to the deficit under Reagan? I mean, this is just an introduction. You should, who, who knows? What, what, what happened to the deficit in the US, Ed? It gets bigger. It gets bigger. Why does it get bigger? Um, mostly because he doesn't succeed in reducing government spending. He just slows the rate at which it increases, which is, of course, helped by a significant increase in defence spending. But, of course, arguably that does bring the cold war to an earlier end than it would have probably OK, been. yeah, good point. Uh, Evan? Uh, I was going to say the military spending was huge during the Reagan administration. M military spending did, did, uh, did mushroom, didn't it? And, uh, and, uh, and hence the mushroom cloud behind the, uh, the left-wing poster that the, uh, the presentation began with. Maybe it does. It depends on discount rates. Maybe it does have a beneficial effect in terms of the Cold War did end. Okay, just another look at Reaganomics and the squeezed middle. So the top 1% do very, very well. The, the top 5% do pretty well, 25%. Um, Everyone else does pretty... This is the whole economy, so the macroeconomic statistics look relatively good, something like 6% growth. But... The 50%, 50% at the bottom, so medium income and below, see a significant drop in income. This is a trend that, that continues. And so this was uh, Martin Gardner's now dead mathematician, mathematics writer, rendition of the Laffer curve. It, it, where to, where is it, trying to find the optimum level of taxation, it just doesn't work. So trickle down doesn't seem to work, and the Laffer curve doesn't seem to work. Reducing marginal <coughs> rates of taxation um, doesn't seem to reduce deficits, doesn't seem to reduce government spending, doesn't seem to reduce, uh, doesn't seem to increase government revenue. Okay, so Thatcherism at supply side. Thatcher, it didn't all begin with Thatcher, as we know. Um, it, it begins before Thatcher, and we've talked about people like Keith Joseph, the mad monk. I think Keith Joseph also has the longest reign at the Ministry of Education as Secretary of State for Education. Starting off as uh, Secretary of State for Trade and Industry under Margaret Thatcher, but he was instrumental in writing this, which was the Conservative Party Manifesto in 79. He was called the Mad Monk because of his philosoph philosophical ramblings, but he was instrumental in, in persuading Margaret Thatcher that supply-side economics was the way to go. But Dennis Healy had already experimented. Dennis Healy, Jim Callaghan's chancellor under Labour, under the last Labour of government that led to winter discontent and cap in hand to the IMF, all of those kind of clichés. He experimented with uh, supply-side economics first, so before Margaret Thatcher. But it's, it's really... It, it's really this period that we think of is the implementation of supply-side economics. But this was the period that I told you about, that I remember Margaret Thatcher in my, in my youth. Mary had a little lamb, she changed it for a cow, it follows her to school each day, she gets free milk now. Not a huge saving. This was her period in the Heath government. Obviously her and Heath do not get on. She gets the leadership and, and, uh, and Heath loses it uh, in the mid-70s. Okay, so what, what's Thatcher's version? So, free markets, okay, all, all of these cliches. Uh, you'll financial discipline, firm control over public expenditure, tax cuts. It looks very, and privatisation. Other than this, it looks very much like Reaganomics. And this is from Marjorie Lawson's book, uh, A View from number, number 11, Memoirs of a Tory Radical.
we'll come back to Lawson over and over again. Lawson was her longest standing Chancellor. He was her second Chancellor after Geoffrey Howe and followed by, who followed Norman, uh, sorry, giving it away there a bit, who followed Lawson? Norman Lamont, yes, and we'll, get, we'll come up to him uh, in, a, in a little while as well. Okay, so in terms of income distribution, how did these changes in the 1980s affect, affect Britain? Institute of Physical Studies, uh, I suppose a left of centre think tank. Over the 1980s, there was a considerable increase in the inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. Who's aware of what the Gini coefficient is? So a good 25-30%. Okay, so it's a measure of inequality. It stabilised uh, in the early 1990s, so the major period, and then fell slightly, so slightly less uh, growth in inequality, and since Labour came to power, the Gini coefficient has increased once more, so increasing inequality under Tony Blair. Okay, but uh, this, is, this is not what we're here for. Uh, we want to know the consequences for British business of these changes. And, and what these changes were. So overall, what was the impact of the 1980s on British business? I need to look further. We looked at some macroeconomic in- indicators in terms of income distribution. So we'll look at some more. We'll look at microeconomic policies. What were those policies and how effective? And what were their implications in terms of productivity? Assuming that we're interested in productivity, but we're also interested in the implications of productivity, which is growth in income, yeah? Job creation, wealth creation. This is uh, quite an unusual moment, picture of Margaret Thatcher with who? Margaret Th- Thatcher was famously anti European, wasn't she? So, Damien, who is it? Helmut Schmidt. It is Helmut Schmidt. So, a uh, uh, Social Democrat uh, Chancellor of Germany until Helmut Kohl, right of centre, takes over. Uh, okay, so macroeconomic outcomes and uh, this is a this is a cliche from English football um, soccer to the Americans here. The macroeconomic outcomes were coming two halves. They have the one half is inflation, the other half is unemployment. This is so. This we've seen this over and over again. This is Saatchi and Saatchi's uh, 1979 election campaign poster for the Conservatives. Labour isn't working. I think we had one point. 3 million unemployed when Thatcher took over. By 1982, we have over 3 million unemployed, registered unemployed. Okay, the definitions change. Uh, but the definitions haven't changed in this period, but they do change over the 1980s, the definitions of unemployment. So later on, we'll be using the international labour organisation definitions, okay, and not the UK government's, but I'll try and remember to highlight that. Okay, so we'll start with inflation. There's Nigel Lawson uh, as Chancellor. He's got a lot thinner and a lot older recently. And more famous is possibly his daughter, who is? Nigella Lawson, yes. Uh, So, and Nigel Lawson famously said, inflation is judge and jury. So getting prices right. Suddenly, this is the big part of supply-side economics. And this does have implications for British, British business. We talked about this when we talked about financing industry. We don't get long-term, l- relatively low interest loans from banks. Banks do not have long-term relationships with British business because inflation has been so unpredictable in the British economy historically in the post-war period compared to other economies where they have been able to get long-term financing in industry. And so one factor, uh, this was almost this, I was going to say, and... Uh, restricting the money supply, but it was all tied up with controlling inflation. This was judge and jury. So, so inflation matters beyond. It allows firms and workers uh, to plan. Low and predictable inflation rates al- al- allow you to negotiate pay over a longer term. So we at LSE, up until uh, last year, I think, negotiated a three-year pay deal for uh, people who work here. Um, it's since gone back to a one-year pay award, yeah, because suddenly inflation is unpredictable again. Um, that makes things difficult. When you're in business, my only experience of business was farming, but I still have to make long-term decisions on the ability to sell stock. And, 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 the, and input prices are constantly going up. So I make long-term deals 
if they are eroded by inflation, that eats away my profit. So getting prices right is a, is a, is a big factor. So annual inflation rates, this is the 1970s. This is average. It's obviously, there are some big spikes here. Spikes up to, I don't know, in, into the 20s. Uh, so this is Conservative Labour, Heath, Wilson and Callaghan, and this is Thatcher, and this is John Major's government. So it looks pretty good, yeah? Uh, I mean, average rates are coming down. It looks successful, but appearances are deceptive. Britain's performance in the 1980s, which is what we're looking at, was rather erratic. So here, here we have them, the, some of the big spikes here. Margaret Thatcher takes over. This looks, this looks pretty good. But then we have spikes again, and then we have considerable increase here. So if you are negotiating pay or long-term deals, you're going to have big problems here. This is going to be problematic for people on fixed incomes, pensioners. They're all going to see their real income collapse with rapid increases like this. It's not until, really until the major government, that things start getting a little bit more predictable. Uh, well, predictable and stable inflation rates. So, I've shown you this before. This is Privatise. For those people that uh, are not from Britain, Privatise is a satirical magazine, um, and its front page is, you know, it picks something current. Lawson says, inflation rates will be his judge and jury, and he says, here I've got inflation up, um, and Thatcher says, surely some mistake, which is a reflection of um, these, this this kind of instability in terms of inflation in, in the 1980s. So if inflation is his judge and jury, is was Lawson successful? And this is just a relatively recent um, private site, just to, um, it's, you know, it's not compulsory reading, it's uh, the front page of UDFI, and there's some funny satiric, it's a very kind of British thing, or even a, just an English thing, I'm not sure, uh, English satire. Ian Hislop, who does the news quiz, I believe is still the editor of Private Side. Okay, so um, we've looked at it in terms of Britain. Let's look at it in terms of other economies. So annual inflation rate. So Britain ends up here, so, sorry, starts the period here of Conservative government. Second, third from the top, almost joins second from the top. It finishes the period second from the top. So, so whilst it does seem to have a, had an effective anti-inflation strategy, comparatively, its performance is not great. I mean, but what we can see in all these claims that chancellors make, like uh, our former chancellor Gordon Brown's end to boom and bust, and Lawson's inflation will be his judge and jury, uh, these are global trends. We can quite clearly see some, you know, that we're just following a global trend here. So all of the all of the effort to try and define the money supply, control the money supply, redefine the money supply, control the money supply, privatisation, cuts in, in public service, cuts in social service, was it all for nothing? Because we can clearly see a range of different governments there, can't we? A range of, uh, and a number of changes in governments, uh, and yet the trend is all pretty similar. And once we're down here, this looks... This looks fairly, other than Italy, maybe is sort of slightly worryingly high, but everyone else is kind of at German levels of inflation rate. And, but things get better with what? With the independence of the Bank of England. And you can quite clearly see that here. So once, once monetary policy is taken out of the political spectrum, the temptation is to just buy votes, isn't it? As you near elections, you will have expansionary policies. This, to a certain extent, takes that out of that possibility. Yeah? Um, so the ability to cheat, if you like, in a kind of prisoner's dilemma thing is, is removed. Okay, so um, whilst for the outgoing Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, um, inflation was a judge and jury, uh, the incoming Chancellor, Norman Lamont, with his political special advisor, uh, who you may recognise. He was then known as part of the Brat Pack. There have been a number of Brat Packs. But he was part of the Brat Pack of the period of the 1992 general election as a special advisor. Um, this, this picture was actually taking, taken on Black Wednesday. What's Black Wednesday? 
Black Wednesday, there have been a number of black days, but what, what's Black Wednesday in about 1991? Which... Well, yeah, it was when Jay. the uh, um, UK left the ERF. Um, exactly. And well, well, George Soros made George a Soros made a lot of money, yes, made a lot of money, and, uh, and Norman Lamont's career really... Uh, uh, never recovered from that. It, it cost Britain a lot of money. We, we, we briefly had interest rates into their 20s um, to try and try and maintain Britain's position within the ERM. Uh, but also in the run-up to a general election, which this was, with increasing unemployment figures, the Chancellor of the Exchequer makes this statement, and one wonders about his political advisor, unemployment is a price worth, worth paying. Now that might be the case. Unemployment might well help help to reduce certain structural problems within the economy. However, you're a politician. Is that something you can say with increasing unemployment rates? Anyway, Lawson says that, uh, and uh, and he does lose his job. So let's have a look at unemployment rates. So unemployment rates. Uh, in the pre-Thatcher period, so this is the period of butsclerism, yeah, the period of kind of consensus politics, Keynesian demand management. We have now Keynes. So this frictional. Do we understand what frictional uh, rates of unemployment are? Who understands that terminology? Is it dated? So some people do. Um, frictional. Uh, it, it's when you're between jobs. So when you graduate in uh, in the summer of some of you this year and some of you next year. Even though you don't have a job, you will be. You won't be classed as unemployed. That, and uh, whatever the statistics say, there's an element of frictional unemployment there. Yeah, in the sense you, you're between education and getting a job, or if you lose your job, you will, there's an element of retraining necessary. Uh, there's an element of search time going on. So this is frictional unemployment. So Keynes thought that about five percent was about the lowest we could go. So during this demand management period, we seem to have you know, below kind of normal rates of unemployment. Um, but things, things dramatically change, and they stay high to, to the extent that this is almost seems like, like a policy of unemployment, part of supply-side policies, possibly, yeah? Uh, towards the end, uh, Shirley Williams in the last Labour government, in place of strife, there were lots of possible, there were lots of touted um, union legislation, which the Labour, the, the la I need to say the last Labour government, the, the government before the last Labour government tried to implement and weren't implemented until until Thatcher came in. But high unemployment rates help in, in the implementation of those. Okay, so does it look successful? It doesn't, does it? In terms of unemployment f figures, they go up. And they stay up. They stay very high for a very long period of time. There will be, as I'm sure you are well aware, and I don't want to dwell on this, there are high concentrations of unemployment as well within different demographic cohorts, yeah? Particularly youth unemployment, yeah? And, uh, and for people at my end of the spectrum, um, older workers. And so there are high concentrations. So this is, this is aggregate. This is annual aggregate over this period, but it's also all of us lumped together, we, you, you will find concentrations of 20, 30 and higher percentages in certain age cohorts and obviously regional cohorts as well within this. So this looks pretty unsuccessful, um, but again, it looks unemployment, it, it looks similar to trends elsewhere during this period. But, so we've, we've gone from Keynesian to demand management pretty much everywhere, including in the US, yeah, Nixon said, almost at the end of the Keynesian period. We're all Keynesians now. And, uh, you know, other than Japan, which looks uh, um, enviously different, everyone else sees, even Germany, sees rising unemployment, and it continues to rise. Well, I mean, what we can see here is the two economies with the most flexible labour markets, after the Thatcher period, Britain becomes one of them, are the only ones that seem to turn the corner, yes? Yeah? So, the, so Britain turns a corner, and uh, the US turns a corner, but everyone else, their trend is continuing upward, even, even Japan. Well, another way of looking at, at this, though, for America is good times and bad. America doesn't look far off the kind of Keynesian frictional unemployment. It's just bumping up and down along, you know, five and six percent. So 
what we have after the, th uh, the Thatcher major period is the Blair government. In the run-up to the Blair government, there are lots of calls from the pressure groups that uh, contribute heavily and now predominantly fund the Labour Party for the withdrawal of the Conservative um, anti-union legislation. This doesn't happen, does it? The only thing I can think of that happens during the Blair Blair Brown period is a minimum wage. That's the only change, really. The Conservative government removed the minimum wage. Labour come in in 1977, uh, 1977 in 1997, and and over the period of their administration, reinstate the minimum wage. Other than that. Labour legislation has stayed the same. No secondary picketing. All of the, all of the policies that Thatcher brought in to increase labour flexibility, labour market flexibility, stayed in place. So Labour continued along that trend. And, and we can kind of see that in terms of unemployment rates, they continue to come down. And to the extent that we, we start off in the middle, we briefly overtake, uh, brief, briefly overtake France, which really, France and Spain and Italy really do have very high concentration of unemployment, particularly in youth. But we, we briefly overtake them as the highest unemployment and we come down to the lowest unemployment below even Japan. I have been a little bit selective here. If you carry that trend on, we're not still there. We, we have this very strange occurrence, which is... Um, you'll be aware that unemployment figures, unemployment is considered to be a lagging indicator. So you have a recession and then a few years later or a year later, you will see unemployment rates rise. What we, what we saw in the last recession, strangely, was that it was preceded by increases in unemployment, which was, which was counterintuitive and, and really quite strange and, and did suggest labour market rigidities, yeah? Structural rigidities in the labour market. And we will we will come back to those or possibilities of those of later on. But the lagging indicator is is something that you, you need to think about. Okay, so it's not simply that people aren't simply made up of employed and unemployed. Um, there are lots of people for one reason one reason or another that, that don't end up in those statistics. The obvious example are uh, people looking after children. Uh, I was one of them um, for seven or eight years. So off the statistics. The other thing is, and we'll come back to this when we look at some of the other economies, um, is uh, the informal sector. Some economies have very big informal sectors, and they're not all in southern Europe. The southern Europe comes to mind. Um, Belgium is one, strangely. Okay, so but Britain generally has been pretty good at getting its people into the workforce despite things like this. So what we had during the Thatcher period, we had this rise in unemployment, and then we had this kind of getting people off the unemployment statistics. Yeah, so we had a YTS scheme, youth training scheme, but I have seen uh, a kind of a revisionist look at that. It wasn't seen as very positive at the time. The other thing we had is uh, expansions in ed education. So a lot of people who would have left school at 16 were, and, and would have ended up in unemployment statistics didn't do so. But having said that, Britain generally does quite well in, in, in having re relatively low levels of hid hidden unemployment. Take note that this, uh, this graph doesn't start at zero. Okay, but if we look at employment levels rather than unemployment levels and compare them across competitive com uh, companies, uh, countries, Britain and America stand out at the top, having the most flexible labour markets, and therefore very high levels of employment. What I haven't put on the, on the graph are some other economies in Europe that have much higher levels of employment, um, but aren't that similar to Britain. They're smaller economies or they're unusual economies, and they are the Scandinavian economies and Switzerland. So Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Switzerland would be way up here somewhere. And bumping along at the bottom is <coughs> Italy. Okay, now, one thing about Italy is uh, <coughs> levels of female employment. Another thing is, is a large informal sector. Okay, so that looks uh, as though a lot of older workers and a lot of people are just off, well, off the books. They are off the books, but, but off the... You know, are not working. People probably are working, they're just not paying tax. 
would be my interpretation of that very, very low uh, level of employment in Italy. Okay, so we talked about certain demographics. So this is the older de demographic. This is contem contemporary or near contemporary. It's 2005, and this is people 55 and over, so slightly older than me. And here we have, uh, here we have the OECD average. Here we have the Euro 15 average. And other than the, the countries that uh, I mentioned earlier, Scandinavian and New Zealand and Japan uh, and the US, Britain is way up there in terms of actively employing older workers, people over the age of 55 who are on the books paying tax. And uh, I mentioned Belgium earlier. Belgium is right down the bottom here, next to the Slovak, Slovak Republic. So what, what is going on in Belgium? Belgium, it seems, you know, no one works over the age of 32, and no one starts work until they're 28, which sounds like a place to live, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I talked to someone from Belgium, and they, they said, which surprised me, because I'm expecting Greece, Turkey, Italy, and, and these kind of countries, but Belgium also has, has a large informal sector. So people are working, they're just not paying tax, yeah? so they're not appearing in the statistics. So yesterday or the day before, you all received, I assume you all received, your census forms, yeah? Did you? Who received them? And we're all social scientists, so we'll all fill them in methodically and, and, uh, and honestly. Anyway, that's one way that we, we, get, we get an idea about what's happening in, in the population. And the other way is paying tax. Because that's just a snapshot every 10 years, isn't it, the census? Okay, so macroeconomic policy. So, so sorry, microeconomic policy. So we've done the macroeconomy um, and uh, inflation. Inflation is kind of both things, isn't it? It's macro and micro. And, and it's, it's important to us in, in looking at British business history after 1945 because it gives, it, gives, it gives business the ability to plan. It gives business the ability to compete. It's very difficult to see in a high inflation economy what's an efficient business and what isn't. Even as a consumer, we have a target price when we buy anything. And... In a high, inflate, high inflation economy, uh, here, here at the front we were briefly talking about Africa, and so one African economy comes to mind. It's very difficult to make a decision as to what is a good purchase and what isn't a good, good purchase in a high, high inflation economy, unless you're dealing in hard currencies and then in that particular economy. So, and we talked about this in financing industry. So conquering inflation was a big microeconomic strategy. Privatisation, and this is about this is about productivity too. It's we talked about this as well. The the introduction of competition. Now that is controversial because a lot of the privatised companies are uh, oligopolistic by their very nature, and so competition or or natural monopoly. So competition is a little bit uh, artificial. However. Under the kind of supply side uh, philosophy, it introduces incentives. It introduces the profit incentive, which arguably increases productivity. So, better industrial relations. Now, this, depending on your political bent, you can call it better industrial relations, flexible labour markets, or from the left, you can talk about smashing the trade unions. And 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 they, they, they really were completely smashed. They have lost all of their power. We are in a recession now, and, and it's, you know, it's not Tripoli, Cairo, and Alexandria out there. Uh, okay, so more education. Now, this is counterintuitive, at least for me. So during the Thatcher period, the Thatcher major period, we saw a massive it's expansion in education, particularly higher education, yeah? A proliferation of universities. Now, at, here at the LSE, we can all be, and I have to watch this because I am being recorded, um, we can be a little snobby about this, but, but one thing that we've come across again and again in this course is education has been a problem in Britain, particularly for process innovation. Now, I have <coughs> tested that process innovation with you, I've sort of coming with... Um, PowerPoint slides I've come with, I don't know, question sheets for you to tick. And the theory goes that higher education gives you the ability to adjust rapidly to new ways of doing things. Um, I'm not sure if that worked out in my particular experiment, but 
the economy writ large, Britain did very badly. Britain has done much better. And w while we try and... America, perhaps, the US, does higher education better than anyone else. But what we don't think of when we think of the US is... is uh, we don't think of all of these little community colleges where most people do their undergraduate degree in the US. Well, Britain starts looking more like that following, following the 1980s. Okay, so the other thing, again, slightly counterintuitive, we associate, we associate Margaret Thatcher particularly, but the Conservatives perhaps more generally with nationalism, yeah? Margaret Thatcher, there's always this image of Margaret Thatcher following the Falklands War wrapped in a Union Jack on a tank. Um, well, she might be nationalistic in that sense, but not in a business sense. I mean, she hugely encouraged foreign direct investment in Britain, and it was a huge success. The other thing is removing subsidies. Removing subsidies from in industry, because subsidies go to the established players, and usually the larger established players that have the ability to lobby. And new entrants, new entrants do not have the ability to lobby. They do not have the ability to get subsidies. And we said in the lecture yes, last week or the week before, I can't remember, that in the current recession, it's small businesses, it's businesses with 10 employees or less that are creating over 50% of new employment. And this is the case here too. These are the, this is the dynamics the dynamic sector. So if you reduce subsidies to the established players, you encourage new entrants and reducing direct taxation. Thatcher did not reduce indirect taxation, quite the reverse. She did not reduce taxation as a whole, but she did reduce taxation in your wage packet. Okay, so did it work? Did all these microeconomic measures work? Um, how can we gauge whether they work? So, again, we go back to productivity and looking at productivity to see whether, because of the implications of productivity rises, um, and if we look at the economy, we can't see much evidence that all of this had much of an impact, it, at least in terms of productivity growth. Okay, so this is the period 1960 to 1979. Bear in mind, throughout the 1970s, we didn't have enough power to be able to do a working week. Okay, so that is not much of a bar. You know, how high is the bar? Not very high. So we had three-day weeks throughout the 1970s with, with the Heath government. We had industrial turmoil. So productivity growth for the economy as a whole, it's not much to beat. Okay, and it does just about beat it, but not by much. Through, through the Thatcher major years. But if we, that was the economy as a whole, if we disaggregate manufacturing, let's, let's see what happens there. And yeah, manufacturing, manufacturing does see a growth in productivity. So, that, so this is the economy as a whole. So what is the economy as a whole made up of? It's made up of manufacturing, and it's made up of um, uh, services marketed and non-marketed, that's government and, and marketed services, and it's made up, up of the primary sector, which is minusculely small, so agriculture is 2%. And so this, uh, so manufacturing does seem to respond positively to those micro, microeconomic measures, but you'd expect that, wouldn't you? You'd expect to see all of the, the impacts of those changes would have impacted mostly in manufacturing. And the other thing that's very difficult is partly because it's very difficult to compete internationally in the service sector. It depends what the service sector is, but the service, the main private service sectors are very locally based and therefore not competitive at a global level. So they're not benefiting from, from competition, international competition. But these, the stats look good in terms, of, in terms of manufacturing. I don't know. So relative labour um, manufacturing productivity. Um, so this is how you compare internationally. This we've seen a graph like this before in the first term, maybe one of Tim's graphs. So probably Tim used lines. Um, so this is Britain at 100. Okay. So if the, the the countries that are above 100 are doing better than Britain, the countries that are below are doing worse than Britain. So 1950. Uh, you know, this is immediately post-war. Japan and Germany have been bombed to oblivion. Uh, they're not doing as well as Britain. France, 
uh, you know, France was occupied, suffered a lot of Allied bombing as well. It's not doing as well as Britain in 1950. By 1979, whoops, everyone is doing better than Britain. And the impact of the impact of the Thatcher Revolution and, and the major government, <coughs> there is some improvement in manufacturing. There is some um, improvement, but everyone is still doing better than Britain. One thing is probably quite quite obvious. Um, uh, well, we'll just deal with services first, and then we'll come back to this. The picture of the services is quite different. Services do not look good. So, 1973, everyone's doing better than Britain. Uh, 1979, everyone's doing better than Britain. And in 1995, Britain's position internationally, in aggregate, is actually worse. Um, almost worse than it was in 1973. So, this is marketed services. So this is non-government. So this is um, this is everything that you can sell. Obviously, productivity. There are productivity measures in some government services, um, but they're not very useful. Things like the fire services. They do productivity studies, but it's how many fires they put out. So they do very well in the summer, not so well in the in the winter. Uh, but uh, marketed services do not look good. Everything the government stuff is not included. So. Why did Thatcher only help manufacturing? So I'll, I'll just let you read these and we'll deal with them individually. So trade and targets, where, where were the unions, privatisation, investment and foreign, sorry, investment and FDI, education. Um, okay, so the tiger economy. So, so manufactured goods. So the, the, com the, country, the com companies that are competing in the manufacturing sector are having to compete globally. They're having to bring up their game. One thing that when you look at the stats, this vast improvement, to make a poor analogy, if, if I wanted to improve my productivity in teaching EH 240 and assume my productivity was based on how many of you get high grades, I could do one of two things. One, I could uh, s uh, select the people that were, that were lagging a little and we can go and have individual tutorials and try and bring them up, or I could just cut you in half and not individually, but as a group. All of those that were doing well, that handed in essays, that came to all, all the seminars and lectures, I would let take the exam. Everyone else, I wouldn't let take the exam. And that, I guarantee and I predict this, would increase my productivity dramatically. So be careful when you look at these averages, these aggregates, because this is what happened in manufacturing in Britain. Okay, the stats look, we improved productivity, but by losing huge amounts of industries. Okay, so all the industries, so Rover disappears, okay, so that's, that's a once and for all massive increase in productivity in man manufacturing. So be careful when you look at these aggregate figures. Mostly, we're just losing the poor performers. Okay, so the unions. So most of the unions, as we've discussed when we looked at uh, the labour labor market, um, are, are concentrated either in manufacturing or the public sector. And we've already said we're not measuring the public sector, we're only measuring marketable services. So any impact that trade union legislation has, ha it has on the manufacturing sector. Um, so the ability to benefit from more flexible labour markets, it, it's concentrated in the manufacturing sector. So we'd expect to see that rise in manufacturing productivity. I was going to say dramatic rise, but it's not dramatic rise, it's a small rise. And when we discount the fact that we've got rid of all the lame ducks, it doesn't look very effective. So privatisation, let's see the role of that as a microeconomic policy. When we look at this, it's, it becomes even more damning, because the privatised industries account for a third of the productivity rise. And again, that makes intuitive sense, because What's left of a lot of those privatised industries? Coal, steel, shipbuilding, not a lot. But what is left maybe is lean and mean, but they employ relatively few, few people, contribute relatively small amounts to GDP. Services do not come up well either, and you'd expect them maybe to, considering that a large, what's left of the privatised industries is in, is in the service sector, and you'd expect to see some of these in increased incentives feeding into increasing increasing productivity, but as, as we've said, we, we don't we don't see that. How does it impact these microeconomic policies in terms of investment? Well, the 1980s arm period is not a decade that we think of when we think of 
increases in investment. Britain does not suddenly become Japan because Margaret Thatcher is the premier. So there's no significant rise in, in, in investment. But what we, what we do see is a change in the direction of investment and maybe a change in the productivity of investment. And just to use a caricatured example, a pound spent at Nissan in Sunderland is probably better than a pound spent in, at Rover, MG Rover in, 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 um, in Longbridge. The money kept going. We are looking at the 1980s. Longbridge still exists in the 1980s. Longbridge still exists now, but just doesn't produce many cars. Lastly, education. So, um, in 1986, over 50% of British people left school at 16. And that means they're going to be in the labour market for 50 years, yeah? For 50 years. And that's the, that's the end of their education. Um, so, by, by 1996... It, this figure was under 30. Now, there is an element of, of hidden unemployment there, but there's also this element of the million plus, yeah, at the new university. So there is this, this doubling of, um, of people taking degrees. And this, as we've seen when we talked about education, we've talked about R&D, when we talked about British industry, and the difference between British industries and, competitive, uh, uh, and, and competitors overseas. Britain looks poor and starts looking better. But bear in mind, when you're looking at the labour market, like when you're looking at any other market, there's a flow, there's an element of a, a stock level and a flow level. And it takes a long time for the new entrance for the post Keith Joseph, post, post Thatcher, post um, John Major period, for, the, for them to filter through into, into the workforce and increase productivity through raising our ability to adapt to change in the workforce through, through, through our ability to cope with process innovation. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's about it, other than...